Well, good morning. We have been in a series in the book of Acts. And for those of you that don't read the Bible much, Acts is in the new part. It's after Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Acts is really Luke part two, written by a physician named Luke who wanted to document all that Jesus began to do and teach. And then he wanted to talk about what happened after Jesus left the earth and sent his Holy Spirit. And we've talked about how God has entrusted his Holy Spirit to us so that now Jesus is not in just one localized place where he was. Now he lives within the hearts and the skin, if you will, of each believer so that you and I can be little Jesuses when we are little Jesuses. That sounds funny, doesn't it? Yeah. But that's what it means, that he can fill us to the overflow so that we can infect and affect change in our world for the good because we are here to usher in the kingdom of God. And so today I want to talk about something that you might not have thought about recently, but I feel like is a very profound idea. In fact, I'm thinking I, we might even do a whole series on this, whole, this idea that I'm going to hit you with in the fall. And here's the idea. Life is made up of intersections. Life is made up of intersections. Like when I come to work, in the office right over here, I do right, left, right, left, right, left, right, left into my parking space. I make six turns to get from point A to point B. Now, along that road, when I come up certain roads, there are cross streets all the way across, right? You know that when you're traveling down the road. Most of those streets I've never visited. I don't, you know, I don't even know they're there. I mean, they're just, I'm zooming on by. But they're part of my life. If I were to stop and take a look at what was down each street, I would get a new appreciation for different things, right? Life is made up of intersections. But more important than street intersections, life is also made up of human intersections. And this is what I want to drill down on today. Because Jesus said, really, you know, if you can get this one right, you're halfway there. He said, love your neighbor as you love yourself. Love your neighbor as you love yourself. And they were like, well, now, who, who's my neighbor? I'm telling you, everybody's your neighbor. Anybody you come in contact with is your neighbor. And so you and I have this great privilege as Christian people. I'm going to assume that I'm going to talk to Christians here for a minute. You and I, as, as Christian people, as followers of Jesus Christ, who have been filled with God's Holy Spirit, have the awesome opportunity to take advantage of the intersections in my life. And here's my big idea that I'm going to flow out of today. What I do with my intersections in my life will determine the influence of my life. What I do with those intersections, when I choose to react in the right way rather than the wrong way, it, when I choose to take the time and stop because Life is full of intersections. Let me give you a story. And, and the story is out of the book of Acts, and it's in chapter 10. And I'm going to summarize it for you because it's about that long. And I thought, you know, rather than read you the whole story, I'm going to hit the high points, and I'll probably get a few details a little bit off, but just go with it. I'm going to get the big idea in there, okay? And, and really, it's an intersection between two people that in the Old Testament, they wouldn't have crossed paths. Under the Old Covenant, before the Holy Spirit had been poured out, uh, this wouldn't have happened. And the guy, the principal character in this part of the book of Acts is, is a guy named Peter who was with Jesus. He was the same Peter that, that, that would always speak up first and think later. And he was also the Peter that was scared the night Jesus was taken away to be crucified. He denied Jesus three times because he was a believer, yet he didn't have the faith to speak out when it was going to cost him something. But after he was filled with the Holy Spirit, after Jesus ascended, Peter became a different person. The, the Spirit infected him in a way that gave him holy boldness. But in the chapter we're going to talk about today, the Holy Spirit really messed with his theology. He really did. Because it starts really in the first part of chapter 10 with a man named Cornelius. Cornelius lives in Caesarea, which is in the northern part of the, the map, if you will. And uh, he was a God-fearer. He gave gifts to the poor, and he prayed. But he didn't know Jesus. So one day at 3 o'clock, as was his custom, he prayed. 
And when he prayed, an angel showed up and said, Cornelius, your gifts to the poor and your prayers have gone up as a memorial offering to God. Now, here's what God wants you to do. God wants you to call for a man named Peter. Peter is staying down the road by the sea in a place called Joppa. If you'll send for him, he'll tell you what's next. And this great intersection is forming right about now. So, off they go. Two servants and a soldier that Cornelius sends. He's a Roman centurion, meaning he's over 100 soldiers or even up to 6,000 soldiers. So he's a man that can think and also give orders, and he feared the Lord. And so did his whole family. So he sends off to Joppa for Peter. While they're on the way down, which was a walking distance, the next day around noon, Peter is hungry. Now remember, he doesn't know they're coming yet. And he goes up and he takes a little nap. Well, he was going to take a nap, but then he got hungry. And as soon as he got hungry, he's up on the roof of this house. There would have been a sea breeze coming in because Joppa's by the coast, right? And in those days, you know, the, the, the top floor of the house was open air. They didn't have a roof on it a lot of times. The roof was flat. They could stand up there. So Peter was up there, and he fell into a trance. Remember, the guys are coming from Cornelius' house to see him, but he doesn't know. He falls into a trance, and a sheet comes down from heaven. And on the sheet are all kinds of non-kosher animals, Animals that he was not allowed to eat because the Bible says you don't eat those things. And Peter looked at the animals. And he's thinking, well, there's some pigs in there and we don't eat pigs. There's some reptiles in there. We don't eat reptiles. There's some birds in there. We don't eat. But this sheet comes down and, and Peter notices all these animals and he hears a voice from heaven that says, get up, kill and eat. Kill them and grill them. To which Peter says, you got the wrong guy. I have never eaten anything impure or unclean in my life. It's against the Bible, God. <laughs> and God says to Peter, do not call anything unclean that I have made clean. Peter is thinking, what? You and I have been raised, and a lot of times we, we say, well, the Bible says, when it, which it does. But see, when the Holy Spirit of God came, everything changed. You see, Peter would have been right to say, we don't eat those foods because the Bible says, don't eat those foods. Because he lived under the old covenant. The old covenant was designed by God to help people understand who Jesus was. It was the rules for a certain group of people. Remember, in the Old Covenant, God said to the Jewish people, remember, don't, don't marry outside your race. Don't do that. Don't eat certain foods. In fact, I want you guys to be set apart in every way because you're going to be a priest the whole world. But you've got to keep apart from them. But now God is saying something different to Peter, through Peter. Peter, get up, kill, and eat. And this vision happens three times. It freaks people out, it, especially Peter. He goes downstairs, and while he's heading downstairs, the Holy Spirit whispers and said, Peter, three men are going to show up at your house here. You're with Simon the Tanner. Three men are coming. They want you, and I want you to go with them. You're going to go up to Cornelius' house. And so a knock comes to the door about the same time he's hearing from the Holy Spirit, and, and Peter opens the door. I'm the man you're looking for. I'll go with you tomorrow. And he invites these three people in who are Gentiles into his home, which would have been another weird thing for a Jew to do. The next day, they hurry off, go from Joppa to, Ces uh, to Ces Caesarea on the north up there, and uh, they meet with Cornelius. Now, this is an opportunity for God to stretch Peter's theology. For a good Jewish person would never enter the home of a Gentile person. They were set apart. They were not to eat with them. They were not to go in their home. And they were certainly not allowed to eat pulled pork. And they weren't, you know. And I think all the things that we love right now wouldn't have happened in a Jewish environment, okay? All right, so, so he goes to the door and, and Cornelius is ready for him. Has his whole family gathered to hear what Peter is going to say. And Cornelius recounts the story to Peter. Listen, I, I, was, I was praying 
and God told me to call for you and now here you are and we want to hear from you and and Peter's like well he wasn't very politically correct you know it, it's usually not a good thing for me as a Jew to, be, to associate with you, a Gentile, but now I see that God shows no favoritism. The angel talked to you and the angel talked to me and put us together, so here you go. I'm going to give you the message that I came to deliver. And then he tells the message. And he says, listen, you guys had to have heard, right, what happened in Jerusalem, that Jesus Christ was a man uh, in, in word and deed and power. He, he healed people. He did many miracles. And how, how they killed him, they hung him on a tree. You guys heard the story, right? You had to know. And then for some of us, we were able to see him as death could not hold him. He rose from the dead. And we are witnesses of that fact. And in fact, here's what God told us through Jesus to do. He said, hey, you guys, you need to tell everybody the good news. And he's preaching a sermon, and he's giving it to him right and left. And before he can get to the altar call, in the middle of his sermon, all of a sudden, everybody in the room who had never heard the message of God, who had never received the Holy Spirit of God, began to speak in other languages. The Spirit fell on them the same way it fell on them in Acts chapter 2, eight chapters before. And all of the Jewish friends that Peter had brought were astonished that the Holy Spirit had been poured out on the Gentiles just as it was poured out on the Jews. It was a shocker. Now, folks, this is really good news for us non-Jewish people. Most, I would look around in here, most of y'all are Gentiles. This was what opened the way that we could have what we have. Because not, you know, God now has... The old covenant was a covenant of exclusion. The Jewish people were racist for a reason. They were the chosen race of God. And they didn't hold it back. They didn't hide it. They weren't politically correct. They said to others, we're better than you. We know it. We're God's people. And they were right. Which is kind of odd, isn't it? In a world where we know now that the gospel is for everyone. And it started, isn't that good news? So all those barriers of class and race that had been erected rightly, remember the old covenant was designed to point everybody toward Jesus. When Jesus came in the new covenant, the spirit dawned on the world everything changed in fact we'll look in about five chapters at the council in Jerusalem of like well what kind of rules are we going to have for these new Christians and they came up with three (laughs) not 600 it's crazy how God works when the freedom of the spirit leads people to do what he wants them to do it's pretty cool so here we go so let me let me get back in my notes because I'm going to get oh I'm going to take all day if I don't all right see our intersections Peter being willing to stretch his theology, to go into the home of somebody not like him, to even be willing to eat foods that the Bible said he shouldn't eat. All of this was something new to him. But he was open to what the Spirit of God was doing that was new. And see, Cornelius was a good man. He was a good person. But he didn't know Jesus, and he didn't know grace. You know, in our culture today, if you were to talk about heaven, the afterlife, what the good life is about, most people would say, well, all good people would spend eternity with God in heaven, right? Isn't that right, pastor? Don't all good people? This is one of the scriptures that say it's not enough to be a praying person. It's not enough to be a philanthropist that gives to the poor those are all great things you can pray and that sets the stage God's grace is working on you but you still need to know what Peter explained to Cornelius you need to know that Jesus Christ was crucified for our sins and forgiveness of our sins our offenses toward God must happen for us to have a relationship with the holy God but when we are forgiven that we can claim the eternal life that Jesus wrought for us when he rose from the dead amen so that's what we believe as Christian people it's not enough it is great that you know a lot of good people and it's great that your friends are good people but if they don't know Jesus Christ is their savior they're lost 
It's not that they're without hope. It's that obviously God wants them to be in the family. So what does that leave us? We, as Christian people, have the awesome opportunity to intersect our lives with people who are good people, praying people, right on the edge of a decision. We are God's chosen ambassadors that maybe we can help them across the line of faith. One step at a time, one reaction at a time. So here's the deal. You and I, we have a timeline today, all right? This is when we got up today, and we were not happy. <laughs> the alarm goes off. Most people don't get up cheery. Now, some of you do, and you make the rest of us look bad, but I, this is what I look like. Oh, <laughs> okay. All right? Now, you've got a timeline before you hit the sack when you're, when you're sad again because you've got to go to bed. And you're like, oh, I'm so tired. Okay, so in between, this is your day. And all day long, you're going to meet with John. You're going to meet with Bill. You're going to talk to Sue. You're going to run into Harry. There's just four names, all right? Four intersections. Now, if you're in the church and you've been in the church all your life, Chances are these four folk are going to be Christian folk, and your intersections are going to be to build them up, to care for them, to love them, and to encourage them, not to gossip with them, not to gossip about them, not to slander anyone in their presence. You want each one of these intersections to be holy intersections, amen? But let's just assume for a moment that this guy here is more like Cornelius, He's close to faith, but he's not there yet. And your intersection with him as a Christian person may be the one thing that turns his almost belief into complete belief and surrender to Jesus Christ. Wouldn't that be cool? Now, let's just assume that you work with a bunch of heathens and every one of these people is far from God. But you're going to get to you have the opportunity to be the ambassador to Christ in their life. The one person who knows the truth is you in their whole world. So when you get up in the morning, you quickly go this. You go from this to this. Because you know when you get up and you've got breath in your lungs, you have the opportunity to intersect with somebody far from God to bring him that much closer to him. It doesn't mean every time you go to work you're going to lead somebody in the sinner's prayer. Most of the time that doesn't happen. In fact, that's where when we become ambassadors, life is more like golf. Now golf starts back here on the tee box. This is going to be the tee box, all right? I know you don't even want them drawing, but I don't even either. So let's just say this is a hole, okay? And here's the green, and here's the flag. Let's make a good flag, Brett. There we go. When you tee off, you hit the ball about that far, right? It's like it's a par four. You got four shots to get to the hole. Second shot, if you're like me, is about right there. Third shot's over here. I'm not very good. <laughs> I'm hoping to get it on the green in four, not hit it in the hole in four. But the idea being... Eventually, if you keep swinging and putt it, you're going to get it from here to here. Now, people are a lot like golf, if you think about it, as a Christian. Our job is not to hit a hole in one every time we step up to the, to the tee. And unfortunately, if you've been around the church a long time, you've heard evangelists do that. Yeah, I was out by the gas station the other day, and I led somebody to Jesus. And on the way from there, I started another church over here, you know. <laughs> and you're like, what's wrong with me? I went to Starbucks, and I didn't talk to anybody because I didn't want to. <laughs> right? I'm here to tell you, take the pressure off, okay? Peter was hungry. <laughs> He wasn't thinking about leading anybody to Jesus. He was just on the roof. And God gave him a new vision because he was willing. God knew who he was dealing with. And for some of you, every one of your social media interactions, what if it were seasoned with grace instead of my way's right, your way's wrong? What if it were just how can I build people up? How can I comment on stuff Social media is a great way to meet people, by the way. It's also a great way for you to reveal who you are to people. 
If you're ugly and judgmental on the inside, somehow it works its way out of your conversation. But if you're filled with the life-giving Spirit of God, somehow it works its way out of your conversation. See, the Spirit wants out, and when you let him out, you bless people. It's a good thing. So let me give you some idea about everyday intersections. This is in your notes. I'm finally getting to the notes. You're like, all right, finally getting to the point. Okay. Every day, other people will cross my path. You got to know this. Okay, every day I know that pastor. I haven't always been what I should be. I'll tell you, yesterday I yelled at Mindy and I shouldn't have yelled at her. And I confessed publicly I shouldn't have done that. That was a bad intersection, kind of like a train wreck. You never have, the, I mean, we all do it. We all do it. But every day I'm going to have some intersections that have the chance to bless people. That's the second thing. I have the opportunity in every connection I make, every single one of them, have the chance to hear a word of grace from me. Not law. You should be ashamed of yourself. Not judgment. Oh, you're going to get it now. But grace. Do you know what grace sounds like? Oh, well... I watched it happen the other night. If you were watching the finals, the Cleveland Cavaliers and Golden State Warriors, it was an epic game. LeBron James probably played his greatest basketball game. He's the best player in the NBA right now, and his team lost. Near the end of the game, it was tied with four seconds to go or so, and one of the Cavaliers is shooting a free throw. He misses the free throw. A Cavalier gets the ball and could put the ball right up again and go up for another shot, at least try. But for some reason, he thought his team was ahead. So instead of shooting the ball, he dribbles it out and runs the clock out. It was a bonehead move. But I watched LeBron wanting to get onto his teammate, but knowing they still have five minutes to win the game. It's not over yet. He bit his tongue and didn't yell at his player and friend. That's what grace looks like. When you have every right to let somebody have it and you don't. What if the world were seasoned with more grace for more Christians? I got a feeling more people would listen to us. Instead of calling us bigoted, homophobic, all the names that people call us today. What if the church were known as the people of the loudest voice of grace you can hear anywhere? You say, well, pastor, we are people of grace, but we just know the truth. <laughs> Again, that's the kind of attitude that's like off to a non-Christian, right? Grace is grace, man. It's wherever you've come from, there's room at the table for you. I don't care what you were like. or God, God loves you. Come on. He just wants to clean you up. It's his job to clean them up. It's our job to catch them. His job to clean them. Amen? All right. I don't to preach there. <laughs> well, every day I got an opportunity to bless people, and every day I have the hope that I can point someone towards Jesus. So how do I make, you know, you know I was thinking that. If I, if I can point someone to Jesus, there's an old saying that says, attitude determines your altitude. Now, that's, that's in business. That's in life in general. If you've got a good attitude, you've got a better chance at success. It's a proven fact that winners win. People who expect to win in life win. It's just winning attitude with the winning smile, the whole thing. It works. It really does. Try it. But attitude not only determines your altitude, it determines your influence. If you want to have a great influence on others and Jesus saved you so that you would, your attitude determines the amount of influence you carry. So when you have a positive attitude, you help people believe the impossible is possible. Because you believe it, they can believe it. If you can believe that Jesus did something great in your life, they can believe it too. So how do I make the most of my intersections? Let me give you the, the uh, old uh, driver's education talk. Remember whenever uh, some of you old timers like me, remember when you go to driver's ed and they said, now if you come to a railroad crossing in the country that doesn't have one of those little arms that comes down, you know, 
and it's an obstructed view, you should do what? Stop, look, and listen. Because there might be a train coming around the corner. And that would have been a good thing to know when I got ran over by a truck, too. <laughs> just, just stop. <laughs> just let him go. But I thought we were friends. We were driving side by side. I didn't know. That's when intersections go wrong. All right? So let's, let's stop. If you want to make the most of our intersection, stop. Right here at this part of your day. Get with God. Peter had to listen to the voice of God before he knew what to do. Now, he wasn't really looking for that. It just so happens. But you have got to learn to stop, to listen to the voice of God and what he's saying and spend time with him. And, and, and So get with God before you start your day. I think it's the most important hour is, is when you get up. What do you do with that hour? What do you do with your brain? Where does it go as soon as you get all cleaned up? Does it go right to the car, right to talk radio, or right to whatever music it is you listen to? Do you allow God to just break in there? you got to learn to stop. If you want to make an influence in these people's lives today, then I need you to stop and get with God, hear from God. He might have instructions. And one of the things I like to pray when I'm, when I'm very aware of these intersections is, God, please show me one of your appointments today. I'm going to be looking. And that's the second thing is look. Look for holy intersections. Those are usually the people with the most needs. They're usually with the people that are complaining about a certain pain. They're usually a person that is asking a question. And that's when you say, oh, God, is this this holy intersection that I've been praying for? And so you begin to look, and it's amazing what you find when you actually look for things. Right? You got to look for your keys. I mean, looking for my key. I looked for them this morning. Mindy, Mindy, she, you, you see my keys? And then there, there they are. I was like, I didn't even look. But there they were, because she usually knows. She, she always knows where stuff is. You ever notice your keys don't just show up? you got to look for them. <laughs> but so you look at other people. Notice people and notice God. You look. You, you connect the dots here. And then look at your own attitude. Are you a lifter? Are you a leaner? This is John Maxwell language. He said there's two kind of people in the world. There are lifters and there are leaners. Are you a lifter or are you a leaner? A leaner leans on others to get everything done. A lifter is the one that actually goes and finds ways to lift and bless. And you know, you might not know who you are. You might have to ask. <laughs> but uh, the other day, I had a couple of staff members, Craig Olson and Louie Thomas. Craig's my executive pastor, and Louie's the director of finance. And we went out to lunch, and we were driving by the Snoco station, and my, my car said, uh, low air pressure. I got one of those cars that talks to me. Low air pressure. And I'm like, all right. But where do I get it fixed? And Craig's like, well, there's air at the Sunoco, and it'll fill it up to the right pressure and everything. And so I pull up to the air thing, and he's like, yeah, just stick your credit card. It's a buck fifty. And he's like, a buck fifty for air. That's not a, that's not a bargain, but I'm going to do it because I don't, want, I don't want low air pressure. So we do the, we do the deal. And w w I put my card in there. Craig's got the hose out already, and Louie's got all four of the little knobs off of the, the, the tires. And I'm looking around going, I don't have to do anything other than do this. Because I'm employing a couple of lifters, people that didn't even have to be asked. They just love to serve. And I was thinking, you know what, that to me stands out more than any other words of affirmation. Is when people actually serve you. It's amazing. It kind of made me feel bad, a little lazy. I was like, well, look, what do I do? You know, this is my car. But that's what lifters do. You got to look at other people, look at your attitude, and look at your own prejudices. Everybody's a little bit prejudiced against something. Some of y'all are prejudiced against certain kind of foods, you know? You kind of like to eat at fruit food places, and you look down on barbecue, right? I don't know what's wrong with you, but I know some people do. <laughs> some of you make prejudices about racism and everything else. Some of you don't. Very few don't. You know, 
the word prejudice comes from the idea that we prejudge. Prejudging just is a way that our brain uses to get things done quicker. Because we don't have time to make judgments about everything. We prejudge certain things. And that's where some of the prejudgments that our forefathers have made have snuck into our hearts. And, and we have to examine, do we prejudge people for where they live? Do we prejudge people for the country of origin they came from? Do we prejudge people by the color of their skin? So we have to examine our prejudices before we can understand what these holy intersections ought to look like. And I'm telling you this, down south, it's really easy to carry around prejudice and pass it on to the next generation. It happens, and it's ungodly and needs to stop, especially among God's people. Because what Peter and Cornelius did was Peter stepped across, across racial lines that God had set up. In the Old Testament. But Peter knew that as a man filled with the Holy Spirit, that God was doing something new in this new covenant that would erase those old things. The gospel wasn't just for one race, it was for all races. It was now the story of inclusion. And so, no matter where you live in this world, no matter what your border policy, it doesn't matter. In God's eyes, we are one group of people, lost or found, for Christ or not. And He wants those of us who have much to share with those who have little so that the Spirit of God can do something new in the world. When you look for the needs of others, you will find needy people everywhere. But if you drive through life at a million miles an hour with your nose in your phone, you'll never see them. So as Christian people, it's up to us to put the phone down sometimes, right? Especially while you're driving. You get, you can hit people on a bike. Stop, look, and listen. Listen for the Holy Spirit. Listen for the words of others. The Holy Spirit is still in the talking business. He still communicates. Not only through sermons, not only through his written word, but sometimes when he's got a special assignment, you're going to say things like, I know it doesn't make sense, but I feel like God is calling me to do this. I know that I don't have the resources. I know I'm not that kind, but God wants me to do this. I know I'm kind of, you know, up there in years. I know that maybe, I'm telling you this, when you listen to that voice, your intersections become holy intersections that the Holy Spirit of God can use to spread what he wants spread, which is good for this earth. Amen? Amen. And one of the cool things that Jesus knew that, that we needed to get across to people was that he is alive. Amen. See, it wasn't just the crucifixion that changed everybody. It was the resurrection. Amen. Dead men's walking. What? That was the shocker. And that's the, that's the stumbling block for a lot of people. You know, and Jesus wants us to know we can live with confidence. When we listen to him, he's right there with us. He's working with us. And as we close today, we're going to be reminded of our connection to what happened on Good Friday. But also I wanted to kind of close us with a daily prayer. It's in your worship folder if you pull that out. In a crazy way, I believe that through this prayer, we have an idea of how God wants us to respond. One day Jesus was off praying and he came back and his disciples said teach us to pray like you pray and he gave what we call the Lord's Prayer or our Father Prayer so what I'm going to do is I'm going to read the the lines in bold right there and I think we've even gotten off the screen but I want you to read the lines that are following that and then we're going to just pause for a minute to let that sink in because for us to have holy intersections we need to go ahead and get this out. And then at the end of this prayer, this is kind of an examining prayer. We're going to receive Holy Communion together. So I want our communion service to come and be ready while the rest of us pray this prayer out loud. So remember, I'll read the first part. You all respond by reading the next three lines. Ready? Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name.
Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. It's all about intersections right there. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation and deliver us from evil. Amen.